Alright, so what I basically did is I wrote a blog post. Right. I thought it was interesting. Did it? Was it? Good. Excellent. Nobody else seemed to agree with that. Brilliant. So, so I'm going to shove it down everyone's throat by putting it into a two or three episode. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Good tactic. Good tactic. <laughs> Excellent. What are we talking about? So, oh, your, your article. That's, yes, we're talking. Once again, I'm talking about workers. Yeah. I'm never going to stop. Brilliant. I've been doing some research and figuring out the rough edges with workers, what actually is the performance benefit and the performance impact, where's the cost, where's the gain, yep. Him, yep. Him, because basically, at the very least, I want most apps to use workers to manage their state, because state, most of the time, right. is completely decoupled from any DOM or most main thread APIs. It's just a state object. Yeah, we see that with like the Redux stores kind of stuff. There's, there's very little in there yeah. that is uh, like, DOM specific. So right. why isn't Redux running a worker, for example? Right. Right. Would be one example. Okay, so okay. let's let's talk about a fictional, another to-do list app because we don't have enough of those. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. But let's let's assume we would put our state in a class, to-do state. It has all the method you would want, like you add a to-do, you toggle a to-do, you could even subscribe to changes, so you get a right. your callback gets called whenever something changes in the to-do list. Um, to JSON, basically, it turns this class into a small. JSON object that you can serialize or send over the wire. And okay. now we have an internal notify function that notifies all subscribers about right, the new I state. See. So right? if, if you put a callback into subscribe, it's going to add it to the subscriber's array, presumably. Right. Right. OK, so, OK. So and what we're doing here is on just on the other side, I added comlink because it makes it easier. So in this sense, we are just exposing an instance of to-do state, which means we can use it in other threads without having to worry about post message. Makes sense. All right. All right. So that means on the main thread, it would look like this. We create a worker, we wrap it in comlink, and now what we have is this instance of the class, even though it actually lives somewhere else. Comlink is magic. Woo! Yay. So what we can do, yeah. we can, you know, on to-do state, we can call subscribe, pass an our callback. So this callback will call it every time the state changes, we could call render, which could be your React render or yep. your lit HTML or whatnot. Doesn't really matter right now. Really inconsistent use of semicolons in this slide. I it's know. Very, Actually, very much bothering me. Only one, I'm missing one. One, two. Oh, fine. I'm missing two. So uh, yeah, <laughs> once they invented prettier, like half I my just, skills are ruined because legit I didn't same. Say. I just I just didn't run it on this for some reason. I should have. Yep. Um, and yeah, and we have if you have like a new task button, you can add a click listener, and you know, call add to do because that's the, that's the benefit that Comlink gives you. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So that's just so everybody's on the same page. Roughly, how I imagine people using a worker, like literally just write a class that has your state and just call the methods on it, and suddenly you have your logic of a main thread, which has loads of benefits. But I'm not going to go into. I wrote blog posts about them. We can link them in the description. More reads for me. All right. Yes. Cool. So, but I want to take a closer look at this notify function because the fact mm. that we're calling a function that is on the main thread while we are in the worker is actually, that's the core magic of Comlink. Right. And that is kind of comparable to this. You know, there's more details happening under the hood. But really, what Comlink is doing, it just sends a message via post message to the other thread saying, you know what? Invoke this function with these arguments and let me know what the return value is. A lot of Comlink is just knowing uh, like the, the thing that called it where to yeah. send the reply back to. Exactly. And that's that's most of the core logic of right. Comlink. Cool. Um, what most people worry about for some reason is, is this slow? Or, or they actually have the, the kind of the assumption that this is slow. Well, you're thread hopping. There's the and serialization. There's the something about serialization, but nobody really, I think, knows what they mean specifically in this head. So I thought, hmm. I want to dig into this. And I want to measure it. And I want to see at what point we are actually entering a problem zone. OK, OK. Right. So, so I looked at the spec, and I kept looking at the spec. And <laughs> I was like, this is a bit overwhelming. Yeah, it's, it's um, the HTML spec. I can I, tell by the colors. Exactly. So I, I, I dug through <laughs> it. I kind of get it now. But I'm going to, for the sake of this episode, I'm going to I didn't have time to read that. I'm going to turn it into pseudocode. Oh, that, oh catches, ho, ho. that catches the spirit. Right, OK. So when you send call post message, the parameter is the message that you want to send. The mm -hmm. target is kind of implicit. 
it, if it's worker.post message, you're obviously sending it to, to the to worker. worker yes, in the, the worker yeah. itself.post message, which implicitly means the main thread that spawned you yep. will receive the message. What is happening is the parameter, which I call data here, the message you want to send, mm -hmm. gets serialized with a function called structured serialize. That function yes. is not real. At least not in the sense that it's exposed to JavaScript, but it exists in the spec. So I, gu I guess we should say that you, your two JSON function that we used before was returning an object, not it, a string. Not a string, no, yeah. not an object. Right. Yes. It could okay. also be a string. It doesn't like structured serialize doesn't care. But, but it wasn't doing its own serialization. No, not really. It was just so, turning yes. it into a a JSON in, compatible in, object. Yeah. Right. I, I see. So the structured serialize will turn this into a serialized format. That serialized format is not spec'd. It's JavaScript engine internal. Right, gotcha. OK. Um, but it basically just means it is some form of binary representation that is not a JavaScript object in its current state, but encapsulates all the keys and values and all the things right. that it Excellent. needs to contain. The next step is queue a task in the target realm. Now, the target realm is basically the thread that will receive the message. And we're now yes. putting something into the task queue that will run some code once that task gets scheduled, which we don't necessarily know when that's going to be. And that's, that's how it's going to schedule. Because currently, you're in the HTML document, but it needs to be doing stuff in the work, on the worker thread. Right. And this is how it gets onto that thread. Exactly. Right. Now, the first step of that task is to turn that serialized data back into a new instance of data. So this is effectively right. a deep copy of our original message object. And yes. this is kind of important because in JavaScript, you can't share objects. Like the, one of the basic assumptions of JavaScript is everything is single threaded. So there is no a, a synchronized or um, parallel access to the same data object or same memory with JavaScript. So we can't just send the same object over. It has to be a copy. Right. And these two steps is how that is achieved. Gotcha. And this is a slight, this is different to JSON serialization because it, it supports more formats. Right? It, it handles stuff like um, cyclic data structures. Yes. Um, it can blobs. do blobs, maps, sets, array buffers, all these things that JSON can not do. Yes. And then the last step here is basically dispatching the actual event. So at that point, your message event handler will get called and will have the data object on the event object, which you can just access. And now you own it, and it's in your own. And all is good. Cool. Brilliant. Yes. Right. So this yep. is how post message works. Now the interesting bit, of course, is structured serialize and structured deserialize, which are the functions that are most likely the, the expensive ones. Yes, of course. But even more importantly, and something I didn't realize before I wrote my article, is that structured serialize is a function that will block the sending realm, while structured deserialize will block the receiving realm. And I guess. OK, so for, for this, for the serialize, that makes sense because it doesn't want to be doing that work while you're editing the object. Right. Right, OK. okay. Well, with ser even with deserialize, it makes sense because it is using the objects of your realm, potentially, like the arrays and whatnot. So it can't really run those necessarily while your code is still running. Right, so if you changed, like, I don't know, the prototype or something halfway yeah. through, you wouldn't expect that to be reflected in. Exactly. But this will be calling this won't be calling like stuff on the global, like the no. new array stuff. Not sure. I, I feel like that could be. I think I've heard they have considered doing that. But as of now, okay, at okay. least it is not. Currently right, it right. will block the receiving realm. Gotcha. So that's actually kind of interesting because it means um, so far I've always been measuring or I I, I keep measuring the moment from when I start sending an object to when I receive it. But the number I get out is actually two parts. It's one part is the serializing, and one part is the deserializing, right. which are happening in different realms. And so I would like to measure them separately, but I haven't found a good way to do that. So I'm still measuring that in my benchmark that we're going to talk about. But just something to keep in mind, that the numbers that we are going to talk about while I do the dreaded micro benchmark, oh, no. okay. um, these numbers will represent the sum of serialization and deserialization. So the actual cost on each thread will be something lower than that number. So how are you measuring that? It's basically I've, you're just bef you make a marker just before you call a post message, and it's More at the other end. More or less. When I, you, OK. Yeah. You've so that's got the message. Pretty, pretty much that's what I'm measuring. Right. Um, I decided to do that because I found a couple of ways how to maybe measure just deserialize in isolation. I found no way to just measure serialize in isolation. But I could only figure out these ways, use these ways in Chrome and Safari, so I wouldn't have been able to do Firefox. And so I thought the end-to-end -end test gives me an upper bound. Wouldn't either side of post message give you the serialized time? Not sure. OK. Maybe. Maybe. 
Right. It might add of other stuff as well. Yeah. Right. Okay. But, okay. So I'd rather do end to end and say like this is the upper bound. Like it will yep. definitely be less expensive than this. So it gives you something. To, it gives you a worst case to reason about, which I think is is probably better if we're talking about resilience and similar issues. So the first thing that I wanted to find out is not necessarily get hard numbers, but just figure out what shape of a message will make post message slow. Is it just right. a really complex object with lots of nodes, or can it also be a very simple object with very big strings as values? And right. so what I did is basically I wrote a function that generates very different objects with sometimes very small with long, long keys between like two to four kilobytes, and sometimes very complex graphs of objects with um, just very short keys and short values, something on those lines. It feels like deep would be more Effort because it's right. going to go, it's going to spin around the serialized function because more. Because if you think about it, the, both maybe. functions will have to somehow traverse the entire object. So yes. my hunch was as well that simple object with longer values would be faster to copy than complex object with simpler values. Turns out it's actually fairly linear with oh, the serialized yeah. payload size. So if you have an object it's like a kind of wave, what's going on? All right, I'm about to explain that. So explain if you now. basically JSON stringify your payload and look at the length of that string Yes. as a size. That's a very, very strong indicator for how long it's going to take. Really? So even just like if it's a thing with just one massive string? Yes. Even huh. long strings take a long time to copy, it seems. Huh. Or the other way around. It's just as fast to copy a complex object and a simple object if the same size. So which well, hang on, what are we talking about? Yeah, so there, keep in mind, both scales are logarithmic, <laughs> because otherwise. <laughs> of course um, they are. Um, so this correlation kind of holds mathematically, mm. but only really for objects above 10 kilobytes. Because if you look at it, you kind of see it's curving inwards. There's a couple of outliers. Yep. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is that we still have reduced precision timers due to spectral meltdown. Right. We yes. also even add some jitter to the timing so that you can to you know make it less useful for these high precision timing attacks that, that were involved. Of course. Um, but also let's add the lower end just some weird fluctuations and static overhead just add skews the numbers more. Gotcha. So this was run on my MacBook Pro, where I ended up with about five microseconds per kilobyte. This number is not really useful. Like, it will be different on any other device. Right. So it's not something that's worth measuring. So it's if just you're a, targeting a low-end phone. Right. Then so I, yeah, yeah. I definitely don't measure these numbers and make decisions of it. I just found it interesting to see like which kind of scale we're talking. Right? Gotcha. So that's basically what I did. So now that I knew Basically, it doesn't matter. Just like the, the stringified size is a good indicator of how long it works. All right. I just want to use that across a couple of devices and see at what point do we run into trouble in terms of rail budgets. OK, so we're talking when, when it starts getting over 16. For versions. example, so yeah, right. that's basically what I did. I started on my MacBook in Chrome, did 1,000 runs for each constellation here, and basically wanted to see at what point do we run into rail budget problems. So basically, what we're looking for is numbers around or bigger than 16 milliseconds. So if we look at this over here, the, the green area, which means anything between 100 kilobytes and 1 megabyte of payload size, that's where, on a MacBook Pro in Chrome, we are in trouble zone. Everything gotcha. lower than that, we're absolutely fine. We won't so risk. So when you say payload, Right. What's the units here? It's not just like three objects deep, right? I mean, it's basically it's like every node on breath. Every node has three values, or four values, or five values, and the depth is how deep do we go? So how complex is the tree that I'm building here? I have more examples right. on my blog post, but basically what we're just looking at is because we know now that object size is a good indicator. We just look at at the at the colors really. So hang on. So, so six six. Are we talking thirty six? What what's the how many? Six to the six. Six to the six. Of course, of course, of course, of course. Right. Okay. So that is quite a big object. That is. Yeah. It that's is why a, we a end up with object. like ten megabytes. And I think each key leaf key is a two kilobyte string, so it adds up to a lot a lot of data. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. Okay. I'm following. Um. So yeah, we can see if we ten cent megabytes, we're blocking for seventy four milliseconds, which is quite a lot. And if we have animations running, that would be too much. Forty seven. 47 milliseconds. You said 74, mate. German. <laughs> Is that how numbers work yeah. in Germany? Yes. Amazing. I did so, not know. So um, 32 in German is 32. Oh, right. Which is I thought you were just joking. No, no, no like, it's, it's legit. Yes, it's uh, still like after four uh, years here, it still screws me up. Yeah, fr three and 20, isn't it? Like yeah. 24. I don't know why. Like everything else in German is logical, yeah. mostly. So it takes 7 and 40 milliseconds. Yes, yep. exactly. 47. Um, but anything below 100 kilobytes, we will be absolutely fine. 
we will, won't block the main thread too long to like make our animations jank. Hmm. However, and this is the most important bit. This is on a MacBook Pro. Like this is not representative of the average device, is device especially. Oh, so so this is gonna when when you're on a phone, right? Like, right. This so is I, our danger zone as much. So I ran it on a Nokia two. So it's right. actually pretty representative of the fiftieth percentile device across the world. Yeah. So it's okay. pretty much in the middle, despite the hardware being stuck in like twenty fourteen, roughly speaking. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh, but, but yeah, look the at numbers that. are worse. Those circles got bigger. Yeah. So if we now look for you know numbers around the sixty millisecond mark. We can now see that, you know what, to be safe, we can't go much bigger than 10 kilobytes. Right? I mean, because this, this here, we have a 12 up here, which might be a bit of a okay, problem. 12 is but you know, if we look at the transition between blue and turquoise, that's between here. So we can't go much bigger than 10 kilobytes without risking our rail budget. But the, the, so the rail boundary hasn't shifted that much. It feels Not like, that much. Like this, this number has got bigger. Right. But like, if you send the, 10 megabytes, you're Bonkers. Yes, it's it's going to take a long time. It's going to take over half yeah. a second. But but generally, it's and it's that's still actually made okay. me really happy because I feel like if you have animations running, you're limited to ten kilobytes. But actually, ten kilobytes is quite a lot. You can put a lot of stuff into ten kilobytes. Yeah, if you're just like shifting around booleans and numbers, which yeah. That being said, do you remember this game that we built? Oh my word, it's Prox. Yeah. So because this is the the maximum possible. Field. It doesn't even actually fit on the screen. It's 40 by 40. That's the biggest field we currently allow. Yes. So it's 1,600 cells. Right, yes. And each of these cells has a couple of flags to store. Uh, in detail, it's actually these that we have in the code. Yes, of course. And that is basically our game state. Like We have this 40 by 40 two-dimensional array, and each cell has this data stored in it, so we know what the game field looks like. Now, it turns out that that JSON stringified actually adds, adds up to about 130 kilobytes of JSON. Oh. So we were way too big to send the entire state over. Yes. And it's and I would say that we're being somewhat like well not lazy, but like it, Yeah, we could we'll, just have one array buffer per cell, for example, or something. Yeah, it could be an array buffer. Um because yeah, what, what about like thirty two well, how many bits of information do we need here? I mean, maybe thirty two would be fine. I mean, because like the touching mind switching flags only goes up to eight. Yeah, which is actually um, three bits. Which is three bits, and then you've got Nine bits. We need nine, nine bits. Nine bits. Right. OK. So this could yep. just be an array buffer. It, it doesn't could. need to be. Or one number. It doesn't need to be two dimensional, because as long as we know the width. Like, yeah. 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 Um, that being said, we ended up noticing that we take. At the start, we were just sent, whenever somebody taps something, we have to send the updated state to the main thread. Yes. So we can re render. Turns out that took too long on the low end phones. Like, we couldn't do that. And we know, saw that, that on, the, on the performance panel in DevTools that that was too long. And now what we did is something else. Now, this is, again, a game field. But we said that we would, instead of sending the entire state, we are sending only the fields that changed. Yes. Right. So we basically did a diff. And that's kind of cool, because that means our the amount that we have to send is now not proportional to the game state anymore, but only to the amount of changes that we do to the game state. Yes. Now, even that, in some situations, especially on the first click, could add up to a lot of data. Because you end up with a big reveal at the start. Yeah. Right, right, so right, that could right. add up to. In theory, it's something about 70 kilobytes if, if we assume that like 80% of the field gets revealed, which is unlikely, but you know, assume a worst case here. Right, right, right. So we did another thing. And that's actually the, the thing I want to talk about because I find it really smart. We've got onto the thing you want to talk about, yes. mate. We have yeah. been recording for quite a while. <laughs> we, <laughs> and now we get to the meat of the episode. So right. when somebody taps a field, yep. our game logic basically traverses through the game field and figures out which fields need to change the state. Mm -hmm. And we record these changes because we want to send over the changes. But whenever we have found 10 changes or more. <laughs> Which we just like, 10, why not? Pretty much. It's the yep. number we pulled up out of thin air. Yep. We send those 10 changes immediately so the main thread can start rendering and doing stuff while the worker keeps going and keeps traversing. Because it's not just the serialized and deserialized cost, it's, it's the cost of just crawling the grid as yeah. well, right? Like, exactly. Yeah. And then we realized that the way we wrote that algorithm to traverse the fields actually looks really nice. So on slow phones, which I have a recording here, it looks like a really nice reveal animation, even yes. though on bigger devices, this will be instant. Like if this animation is disabled, so it will just be, will yep. be there immediately. But on slower devices, you will get a nice animation. Yes. And this is how we made this huge state object actually work on the lowest of low-end devices. And I, I thought I was quite proud of us for doing that. Well, and we to, to the point where when we found this, uh, when we saw this happening, 
we made it happen on desktop as well, just yeah. artificially with the uh, animation. Yeah, we delays. artificially made desktop to get this animation. Because it was it was the second pass of this algorithm. Because the, the the first time we were doing depth first, yeah. and we ran into stack problems, and then so we switched it to be queue based, and that's when we ended up with right. Like, the oh. point is that for you for managing your set in a worker, there are so many little tricks you can do without bending over backwards that. I think there is no good excuse to not put your signal worker. It helps you so much mm. on these loan devices. We've actually we have done a test where we ran procs all on main thread and it performed horribly. So we actually are really glad we chose to use a worker right from the start. Yeah, especially because we have animation happening all the time, right? Yeah. It's, it's difficult to see probably from, from this angle, but there's a the, well, because this is the no animated view as yeah. well. Uh, but usually these little squares have got in, inner they animations. They rotate, like we actually have WebGL running. We need all the budget on the main thread we can get to do yeah. WebGL. So everything else, as much as we can, we moved it somewhere else, and we're quite happy we did that. So I think yeah. post message has a cost, but mm. not the point where it makes off main thread like completely unviable. So I'm hoping that you know with this people will be kind of inspired to try it out and give off main thread a shot for managing the state. Yeah. We have some jitter that is artificially added, and of course, we have artificially added. <laughs> artificially added jitter. Sorry. Um, say, say, say it's artificially added again, because <laughs> I interrupted. <laughs> and also, you said artificially added. Did I? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty sure you did. I didn't even notice. <laughs>